I know. This is the toughest panel, the timing, so I'm going to help them out. <laughs> Any panel after lunch is a bit tough because they need a lot more of your attention and you all are just tired after lunch, so I'm going to fire it up. I don't know how, so we'll see how we're going to do it together. We're now getting to the crux um, of the topic, basically moving more into sustainability, and this is exactly the title of this upcoming panel moving the construction needle towards sustainability and a circular economy. What this means, basically talking about decarbonization initiatives, how they're gaining momentum. The panel will cover the benefits and of course the challenges still and highlights how the circular economy's approach to designing, producing and consuming goods is driving efficiencies and new business opportunities throughout the construction project life cycle and beyond. I'm thrilled to be introducing this set of panelists, starting with Dr. Dila Ersenkal, Group EMS Manager, Principal Advisor, Environment and Sustainability Lead, Mott McDonald. Dr. Dila is a grade A professional environmental engineer with more than 20 years of an environmental and sustainability experience in design, engineering, construction, and operation of a wide variety of projects in mining, metal processing, energy, oil, and gas, transport, and infrastructure sectors. Welcome. <laughs> She'll be joined with Ahmed Sayed, who is the Regional Business Development Manager at Axiona, with 15 years of experience in large-scale projects and leading companies in the region within multidisciplinary teams and diverse background as well. Ahmed's experience includes project management, lead generation, deal structuring, contract negotiation, and supply and demand analysis. Welcome. <laughs> With us also is Maryam Tanamsani, sustainability consultant and chair, UN Global Compact Network, Saudi Arabia. Maryam comes with over 13 years of expertise in sustainable strategy development, strategic communications, change management, consulting, and project management, as well across academic, land development, fashion, and sustainability sectors. She is the CSO of MBL and is carrying sustainability consulting for key organizations, including the MOC. Welcome. Beautiful Abaya, I have to <laughs> say. Thank you. Stunning Abaya. Niall Murphy is the Associate Director, Technical Design, Miral Asset Management. Um, Niall is the principal for Abu Dhabi mega projects such as SeaWorld Abu Dhabi, Etihad Arena, Yas Bay Hilton Hotel, um, a lot of several landmarks that are now um, known around Abu Dhabi. Niall is the sustainability lead in Miral, pushing for sustainable design and construction. His efforts and innovations have included the WBW 7 MWPV project and ice storage backup at Etihad Arena. I hope you get the chance to tell us a little bit about these achievements as well. The wonderful moderator for this panel will be Carlos Mendes, KPMG Partner Advisory, with 24 years of professional experience across industry and consulting, with deep expertise in major transformations across both private and public companies. He's passionate about sustainability from strategy to implementation. Good luck. Here's your timer. Anything you need, Jesse is right around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So easy after lunch. This is the best session that we have prepared. That there was a reason for us to speak after lunch. So uh, as the, the, the topic was mentioned, right, changing the needle. Uh, we've heard in the first session that sustainability is the new digital. We take it as sustainability is the most transformational topic that construction industry is going these days. And we benefit the fact is also one of the most emotional ones. Uh, we are talking about uh, a topic that has been, we have been speaking amongst ourselves over the last 20 years. We've been passionate about it. And uh, I would start with uh, Mariam uh, in terms of what does uh, sustainability means to you? And a little bit of a deep dive from the sustainability to the ESG and the decarbonization that is part of the, the topic for our conversation. Definitely. So I would like first to start with something I always say, everyone needs to understand the difference between sustainability and sustainable development. So sustainability is what we do as a goal to achieve a better planet for, to secure resources for the future generations to come. However, sustainable development 
is the way that businesses conduct the business in order to achieve the goal of sustainability. And how do we do that is by infusing a full strategy that is not in silo of your core business strategy. It has to be there, it has to be infused with every aspect of it across the three, the three spheres of sustainability, which is social, environmental, and economic. A lot of companies that I've worked with as a sustainability consultant, and most of also you need the entities, uh, whether it's government or private sector, they look into it more as a project-based approach, where they have a project that is to deal with either the social element of it, or more, as we are seeing now, those energy, you know, the renewables, the decarbonation, so it is more tackling the environmental aspect. While in order to embed real sustainability, you have to work in balance with the three spheres of sustainability. And this is something that you need to do with a full assessment of your value chain of the entire business, from where it starts and how it ends. You need to look, you need to assess where your impacts are and relate that to what we call as the global measure, which is now another trending aspect everyone is talking about. Let's do ESGs, let's do the SDGs. And I see a lot of companies reaching out to me, listen, we need an ESG strategy. Or, you know, it's confusing. What is the SDGs and what is the difference between them and the ESG? So you need to make sure that you do understand what each and every global measure means and how do they interact and how do you actually better use a lot, utilize it to speak the language of sustainability and make sure that the people within your company really understand that in order to achieve your sustainability strategy. Because I am an assigned chief sustainability officer and I've been doing so for the last four years for different companies. It is not a one-man show. Everyone has a part to contribute to in sustainability. Every single department in the company, every single function has to play a role of sustainability. So this is in a nutshell what sustainability definition is and how to act for it. Now, when you start assessing your initiatives and your impact areas and relating them to SDG, like the impact areas of, let's say, for example, the climate action or the energy. So then you will start creating initiatives that fall under decarbonization, the circularity and so on. So this is relating what you do to how to achieve the, this desired goal and impact of you know, decarbonization. And the initiatives are limitless, especially within the construction industry, right? Because we are, it is one of the most polluting, you know, industries that contributes to the, uh, the GHG emissions. It's like almost 40% of the entire account of the globe. So we need to really understand how to do it properly in order to assign and, and just make things fall in the proper way. And most importantly, do not go for the big transformational things, right? Like, so I'm doing decarbonization it means I have to Im immediately do renewables. It means I have to ha put a lot of like new and inv huge investments in place. No, you can start with simple things as policies. You can have very quick wins as energy efficiency within your building, within the way you act. You can start by like uh, the trip, the route optimization. So there are so many things that contribute to this uh, CO2 emissions and how you can actually utilize that. And then move forward as you grow with the sustainability strategy, grow your goals as well. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. And again, it is still a golden triangle, right? From time, cost, quality, now economical, social, uh, and environmental. And you mentioned walking the talk. So we have Ahmed here. Uh, Jesus was proud saying our action has been uh, carbon neutral since 2016, right? And doing this by business as unusual. Uh, I think it was uh, Henry Ford that say, if you ask people what they want, they would only wa want for faster horses. So this builds, building or uh, business as unusual is important part. So tell us a little bit more about the post carbon neutrality and what uh, uh, Acciona and you are passionate about the, the next steps in this journey, right? Um, first of all, um, I massively appreciate being in this event um, with the phone openers. Um, and I would like to start with the rationale behind uh, this idea. The company vision in general, it's reacting to an existing issue. The, you can see it now. Um, sea levels are rising with a catastrophic level. Um, a lot of animal species are becoming extinct. Um, that's an that's, that's ethical thing to do, is to adopt sustainability. It's part of your responsibility towards the planet. So for Axiona, just to be more detailed, 
we have sustainability master plan, as Jesus mentioned. 2022 to 2025, we have adopted a regenerative approach. A regenerative approach is basically saying that doing no harm is not sufficient and we need to reduce our previous impact to the planet. So it, it's applied at several dimensions, but I just want to um, highlight here one important thing is the, most of the initiatives are not there as marketing tricks. It's uh, real, we have very impressive figures in Acciona that we are proud of. So we have at the environmental dimension, we have 13.5 million ton of carbon emissions avoided. We have 75% less waste sent to landfill, 75%, that's a huge figure. We have 77% of waste recovery. So at social level, besides the labor, welfare, and well-being, and we have filling the diversity gap, we empowering women, and more importantly, we train leaders to change. So adopt the sustainability standard within their plans as a leader. At um, environmental, social, and uh, the uh, uh, governance level, beside the anti-corruption policies and transparency, we have a database of 50,000 suppliers. 50,000 suppliers and subcontractors, which is, we are considered like uh, business partners. So we, we do have uh, sanctions against irresponsible businesses. So if you are a supplier or a subcontractor and you are making a serious incident, you are blacklisted with an Acciona. And so coming back, what are, would be the benefits out of this? So the obvious benefit is the easy access to ESG uh, and green markets. As Jesus mentioned, we have secured $480 million of green finance loans for three sewage treatment plants in Saudi Arabia. But more importantly, in the Eurozone, 84% of the fund received in Acciona is green. And this is not easy thing because in Europe, you need a second party opinion, SPO. That will provide assurance to investors that the company's operation and its activities and the framework are aligned with the green loan principles. The second would be, if you are a company with a competitive financial returns, steady growth in revenues, steady growth in profitability, plus you have a measurable social and environmental impact, you become always a target for ESG investors. And actually that's helped the company stock price to be steadily growing for the last 10 years. The third, which I think that's more relevant for, for, for now, is it's very hard at this stage to assess the social resistance to some projects. It's very hard. Um, we all remember, uh, for example, one year ago in Queensland and Newcastle ports in Australia, where the uh, port expansions were shut down to do protest and social resistance. So as a project owner, when you have um, a construction company that with very good environmental reputation, it helps you to overcome the social burdens. Fourth and last, actually, but not least, um, the perception and satisfaction of employees when you apply very strong social uh, measures. It helps you to retain and um, attract new talents. And more importantly, that helped to smoothen and improve the operational resilience. That's, uh, that's it. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent uh, share. And by the way, you've seen this is the most diverse panel that we yes. had so far. Diversity uh, and inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, a, that is a very important uh, detail when, when we've discussed the, the talent. And um, Dila, so next to you, We've heard about the Mariam sharing with us a little bit the broader perspective of sustainability and decarbonization, Ahmed, on, on some of the benefits of 
ESG, and ESG is gaining momentum, right? In terms of okay. sometimes it's easier to send someone to Mars than to get a ESG rating. Elon Musk can tell us more about that. But what have you seen from your experience in terms of the momentum, the opportunities, and where you have been focusing these days? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos. And uh, thanks to PMI for inviting us over to this uh, very important panel discussion. Uh, sustainability is definitely at the heart of our business as Mont McDonald. That's quite key for us. And as an environmental engineer and sustainability specialist, we have been implementing sustainability principles uh, not only within our organization in the company, but also within all the projects that we deliver across the world. So coming back to your question about how we see the change, the shift with regards to sustainability in ESG is definitely it's picking up these years uh, uh, for the past couple of years. But as an environmental engineer, I can say that environmental principles, social impact principles, governance principles were already being implemented even 20 years ago, but maybe not necessarily here, but in other places in the region, in the, across the globe. What I like about the region right now is that, and also across the globe as well, people are being more aware about what sustainability is, coming back to Mariam's point in what is sustainability versus what is sustainable development. And there was a discussion about the stakeholder engagement in the previous panel discussion, what the stakeholders are also expecting from the organizations as well as the projects in terms of the performance of the companies and of the projects when it comes to environment, sustainability, and social. So ESG is a huge umbrella. It's really hard to articulate it uh, and break it down. But when you look at an environment, decarbonization or the GHG emissions, carbon impact is one of the key elements, of course. But then we had uh, presentations from uh, the Red Sea Development Company, right? So they were talking about the biodiversity, the mangroves, the seagrass, the natural ecosystems that they have. So we need to also consider those impacts, the potential impacts on those as well. So a couple of examples from the environment. Looking into the social aspects, there is definitely the um, uh, element of the social, how we deal with the communities that we are providing our services to. And again, there were discussions around how are we going to ensure that the projects that we deliver are in the longer run are beneficial for the communities that we operate in. So we should not ever let, um, ever forget about the communities and the social aspect of it. And that brings an EDI, uh, equals diversity inclusion, that brings in uh, occupation, health and safety, that brings in the wages, that brings in youth empowerment. So a lot of uh, components as part of social. Then let's move on to the G element, which is a bit more complicated because, you know, there is the tax issues, there is the organizational structure, there is the transparency, ethics and so on. So why I'm highlighting these, it's not easy to resolve and to come up with solutions for the full ESG umbrella. But why are we seeing this momentum, the shift? I'm going to tell you why. Because of the ratings of the organizations. Right now, when you look into the newspaper, when you look into uh, all the headlines, ESG headlines, now there's bulletins going out, there's no one single day, there's no news about ESG. One day you hear about, for example, Tesla, having these electrical vehicles and so on, which is great from the environmental perspective. The next day you have another news saying that they do use child labor in some other parts of the world. So basically it's a very, very challenging environment for us. So that's why uh, organizations should be really careful about the right balance between what they promise in terms of their ESG strategies so that it won't be considered as greenwashing. That's another dilemma. And also coming back to Mariam's point, if you embrace that culture of ESG at the higher level in the organization, then it's really easier to cascade it down into the projects that you deliver. So that's what I believe in. I guess I already spoke too much, so I'll come <laughs> back to my point later on. Well, hold on, Thank because you. again, what I'm hearing is, and this morning we spoke a lot about project management, project delivery, and the outcomes. And what I'm hearing now is even on the legacy part. So in addition to these outcomes, there is the whole legacy part 
that again can be a blessing and a curse, right? Uh, and talking about these, uh, let's say, additional or broader context, and uh, Niall, you are best for last. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that culture change, that mindset, and almost uh, the, the, the behavioral change that uh, we need to see and Miral is, is already working on to enable this change. Thanks for the opportunity to speak and wow, there were three really good opinions, so to follow on from that is quite hard. Um, I'm going to talk about it as my experience as a developer and as a government developer for Abu Dhabi and the way people's mindsets have shifted, even in a short period of time, last 18 months, when we were talking about sustainability uh, probably five years ago, people weren't really that interested and it's gained so much momentum uh, with just a few key partnerships that we have engaged with uh, in the market. Uh, we have looked at doing some real big renewable projects with key uh, stakeholders within Abu Dhabi, that one of the main ones being uh, Mazda. Um, and we've engaged and found that engaging with stakeholders and supply chain early in projects is key. Uh, it shifts the paradigm of where sustainability sits when you're developing projects. Um, there's so many easy wins that you can achieve through projects if you start talking about sustainable goals from the beginning of the project. It's very difficult as the sphere of influence changes and gets smaller and smaller as you go through the river stages, if you don't put those inherent sustainability goals in at the early stages, it's like trying to pull you know, uh, a mountain if you try and start talking about it at the end of the project. And I feel like it, you need to tap into those key stakeholders which are available in the market. They're experts. They can come and analyze assets that you already have. They can talk to you about how other players in the market are hitting sustainable goals. If you don't have those conversations early on as a developer, you've missed the mark and you will never hit sustainable outcomes. Um, and we've seen it as a, as a life cycle of two massive PV projects that we've done. And the, not just the, the maturity of the um, consultants and GCs that we're working with, but also governance with people like the Department of Energy. Uh, when we first went for our first solar projects for Warner Brothers World, uh, the cap was 4.99 megawatts as an off-grid uh, PV solution. Through really in-depth technical analysis with the Department of Energy, we were the first non-utility grade uh, developer to get a seven megawatt license. Then on SeaWorld, we proved to them again that we could go higher. We were talking about 13 megawatts at one point. Unfortunately, it didn't end up that, but it still ended up at 8.2. And it's having these conversations with key stakeholders, whether that's the Department of Energy, whether that's a consultancy team, whether that's a contractor, bringing those players around the table and explaining what you want to do from the early offset, I find is the, the, the way forward with sustainability. Thank you, Niall. And again, that, that case is impressive. I'm actually based in Abu Dhabi and it's quite of, a, of an inspiring pro project to see. So um, again, we have covered a little bit the, 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 the changing the needle context, but now some of the, some additional evidence, right? And Mariam, I'm going, over to you again in terms of asking, we have net zero, we have profit, they would normally sit on different sides of the table. Uh, how do you, we've seen now many studies sh sharing a vision on which you can actually link them. And uh, can you share some of the cases that you know? Uh, that Definitely. So first, yes, it's a misconception that always sustainability comes with an additional cost. But if you actually look at it, like the triple P is, or the, what we call them the bottom line is that you need to increase your profit while attaining sustainability. And one of the main things I always like to present to CEOs, because numbers 
and financials capture their attention to sustainability, right? So when you tell them it's not about spending your money, actually it's gonna make money for you. It's gonna create new revenue streams by, you know, uh, instead of just dumping the waste you have, you will st uh, start a new line of like reselling, which you usually dispose. You will start to like optimize the things you're using, more efficiency in-house. The bills are gonna be reduced, right? So when they see numbers, they usually get attracted to the case of sustainability. So getting back to the question now, um, usually we do, uh, or personally, I like to always, as I mentioned, involve the entire you know, team in the journey of sustainability. So it is important to align the CFOs with what sustainability is and how to capture it and how to look for the sustainability trends in the market in order to assure that they're tackling it profitably, right? Because there are so many you know, elements to it if they don't understand what is sustainable finance or how to like, look into sustainable investment uh, from a financial perspective, they're gonna lose a lot. And I have personally seen a lot of businesses that did not even you know, seek to address a potential investment or just missed the wheel of change because of sustainability elements. Uh, one of the examples um, I would share with you on a different part of the financial element is, now we have seen companies like Neom, like Amala, Red Sea Development, they're all bringing new standards to the construction market. I was working with one of the companies that was tendering for their project. Yeah, it's a construction company. The gap between what they are requesting as a sustainability standard and what the contractors and the actual world are doing is huge, it is massive. So in order to uplift or fill this gap, you need to do a lot of education to uplift you know, the standards. And it is always with the construction, and, and that's the reality, it's about costs. And then they would go like, but Miriam, why would we embed a lot of like sustainability initiatives or sustainability investments, and then the contractor or the developer will not pay extra for whatever we're doing for sustainability. So I have the privilege to work with both the regulating side, which is the government, and uh, the private sector companies. And I kept telling the private companies, listen, the, the change is coming and this is not gonna be something optional for you to do. So you either start ahead of time and think of like how to embed sustainability and lead the change, or you're gonna be forced into it or left out of the business. And some companies are already out of business because they could not cope up with change. So now it is a requirement and I am working with PIF projects including Jedda Central Development. The contract itself had a lot of sustainability elements, but the people that were reading the contract and the tender, and you know, just preparing the tender, fail to understand what does these requirements mean? How do they translate in operations of sustainability? So they thought waste management is just about, you know, collecting the waste and recycling it somewhere. No, it actually requires, you know, an approved collector, a complete visibility, and it actually is about a lot of other elements. So they calculated the cost wrong, and now they are at loss of the project because they do not understand how the entire real processes of sustainability are. And this is why the demand now for professionals to come and do the right awareness on sustainability is very, very important across, you know, the different department, including the financials, just to make sure that they're not missing on opportunities, they're not getting into a lot of cost, um, you know, negative elements. Thank you. And, and again, during these last 20 years, there's, there's a lot of uh, almost rules that change, right? Yes. 20 years ago, you would apply for a clean development mechanism yes. project and you have the criteria of no additionality. So you were almost forbidden to have uh, yeah. a positive uh, net economical impact. Yeah, so well, now also we have governmental entities that are newly introduced in the Saudi, you know, um, governmental system. So we have CERC for recycling, we have NCEC for en uh, environmental compliance. And believe me, they're giving the contractor a hard time. So it is happening, right? And you need just to get on board and try to understand really how to embed it so just you can operate successfully within the elements. Cool, thank you. Uh, Dila, now... How are we thinking about the design and the, the concept of some of these solutions? And uh, even to Marianne's point, how we are uh, aligning them with these different stakeholders. So 
What's your perspective and some, some, some nice examples of... Yes, I can, I can definitely give you examples. One thing I would like to point out is the importance of how to consider sustainability principles as early as possible within the full uh, life cycle of the project. I think Ahmed already mentioned about that. Uh, that's quite key because uh, the business as usual model, which was the linear model that we have, was the take make and waste or dispose. So basically, uh, right now, uh, as we, as this ESG trends are moving uh, ahead and so on, there's also the other concept of circular economy. Yes. But I would like to hear if everybody here is aware of circular economy and what that basically means. Are you asking people to raise their arms after lunch? If they want to, <laughs> yeah, that could be good exercise also. One, two, three, okay. four, to okay. have to reinforce lunch for tomorrow. That, that's great, <laughs> because again, um, similar to ESG, also circular economy is gaining huge importance within the region as well and also across the globe. So what, that, uh, what circular economy does to our linear model is that take of that waste element out of it. So basically to designing out the waste element. And what does that mean? That means to incorporate more decarbonization strategies into your uh, project life cycle. That means to be able to use some secondary materials. That means to recover some of those materials uh, in other parts of the projects or, or in other parts of the uh, life cycle. Um, uh, that means that uh, you need to uh, uh, focus more on optimizing and uh, streamlining the processes that you have within your projects and so on. So it's also a way of systems of systems uh, approach. That's how we say it. Okay, so uh, you asked about some examples. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention in, in, in addition to Mariam's point is that uh, with regards to the contractors, it's really important to ha hold hands of the contractors or whoever is working on the projects to ensure that they have the right level of understanding of sustainability. And uh, you're right, when it comes to the requirements, it could be quite cumbersome. Some projects might require, you know, lead gold, lead platinum. Some projects require uh, pearl, estidama. Some projects require sea cool and so on. And even way beyond those standards that are in place when it comes to sustainability. So basically, uh, we really need to make sure that they are all aligned in terms of what our expectations are from the contractors when they uh, will implement the sustainability principles. I would like to give you an example from a recent project that I was involved in for the past four and a half years. And uh, uh, the reason I'm going to bring that into place, and uh, in the break we were having discussions, and one of the key areas is that the client or the project developer has to also have some ambitions with regards to sustainability. Because if it's coming from the client, then it's easier to implement it by the contractor with the guidance of the PMC or the supervision consultant. But if it's not coming from the top down, especially in this region, it's a bit harder to implement or embrace that kind of culture. Uh, so the, the recent project that I was involved in is a, a big pumping station. Uh, which includes a pumping station plus a uh, tunneling works, which had 10 kilometers outfall chamber, uh, which was established 15 meters below the seabed. So that included the pumping station, construction works, the tunneling works, plus the marine offshore dredging and drilling works. So lots of environmental constraints, lots of social constraints as well. But one of the key requirements of the project was to comply with SQL. Anybody heard of SQL here again? That's another standard uh, with regards to the infrastructure, how to embed sustainability into the infrastructure projects. So this project had the goal of implementing and achieving SQL uh, good level. What we did was after uh, embedding the sustainability principles, uh, the project received very good level, which is uh, almost uh, close to excellent. Uh, and how, how uh, uh, we achieve that? Uh, there's massive tunneling works. Imagine you're having the EPB tunnel boring machine going below the seabed, 10 kilometers uh, long. Lot of excavated material which is generated from that. So coming back to the circular economy point, that hole 
excavated materials that were generated from that project were reused on the project again. Or we had the dredging and drilling works in the marine environment. All the dredged material was again 100% fully utilized. In one of the uh, previous panel discussions, they were talking about the technologies and so on. And one thing which is good is that implementing some digital strategies or uh, tools like the BIM, uh, building yes. information model systems and so on, that also helps the circular economy, that also helps decarbonization. So it's quite important to uh, keep these things in mind when delivering a project to ensure that sustainability um, uh, expectations or the aspirations are achieved. Thank you. Dil. Just one more point on that, because you mentioned so the, 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 own, the project owners or the, the clients are very important stakeholders of defining this value, right? And we mentioned that in some cases these mega projects or 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 some of these uh these out deliver or the, the legacy that these mega projects can create might not even be envisaged at the beginning right who would have thought that uh two years after expo 2020 we would be accommodating cop 28 in the same venue what do you see in terms of how the owners and how the the stakeholders in these mega projects can keep on iterating and looking for this additional value across that long uh, life cycle that, is n that does not end when you turn the key or even when the asset is, Absolutely. but in the long you, run. You have to think of it way. That's why it's quite important to identify the project justification and the needs for the project and how it can enhance and contribute to a longer term value. I'm based in Qatar right now. Uh, uh, November, it's coming up. I don't know how many football fans we have here. The World Cup is coming. I'm definitely a huge fo uh, football fan. I can see some hands here. Uh, so as you know, they built eight uh, massive stadiums. And I, I, I actually was able to touch the uh, pitch of one of the stadiums when they laid it down. So I don't know if you're aware, but for example, uh, the organization is um, carbon neutral. Um, uh, a majority of the, coming back to the point of the legacy aspects, what's going to happen to those stadiums after the World Cup is over, right? So there was a project legacy component to that where uh, they identified how they can use a modular um, uh, mo modular facilities. For example, one of the stadiums have these mo uh, containers which are built up from the containers, which later will be used for other purposes. And again, some other stadiums will be used for hotels, some others will be developed for a uh, into a school format and so on. So basically, these are quite important components or the aspects that a project owner has to consider uh, for the legacy of the project, for the long-term uh, long benefits. Cool, thank you. Thank you for clarification. Um, going a little bit into the solution space now, uh, back to Nile, and even if we can deep dive a little bit, uh, you mentioned that energy efficiency has been one of the aspects where Miral has been improving and improving again, almost like no satisfaction there. <laughs> There's no satisfaction. So we can always do better. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more in terms of how you uh, get the, that uh, that lessons learned and how you keep on uh, building on those and, and adding value to, to some of the projects. What's difficult for where morale is within the construction industry is every single development that we build is unique. You know, you look at um, uh, Project Cordoba, which is the Abraham, Abrahamic family house, the church, mosque and synagogue, the combined cultural project, which is going to be, you know, a cornerstone of the cultural district in Abu Dhabi. We're building something like that one day and then we're building the world's biggest indoor aquarium the next day and then we're we're changing the presidential palace into a tourist destination which it was never built for with conservation labs in the basement it's the sphere is always moving and the best way i find of driving change and hitting kpis is not only uh looking forward to the contract documents that we're entering into with consultants and contractors, but is also looking back, giving those consultants or contractors visibility on the existing assets, where we've learned lessons, where we've done things completely wrong and we've had to go in and, and, and redo them. Every single one of our consultancy teams and contractor teams tour the majority of our assets to understand how our asset class perform. And then we agree on 
uh, KPIs through the design and the delivery of each one of those assets, a mutually agreed KPI. There's no point putting in a KPI that is not achievable because then you're going to be, uh, we spoke about it earlier on in the previous panel, is that's when, that's when you get a breakdown of contract deliverables and it's, oh, do you deem that that's part of your um, delivery? Well, we as a client are going to sit here and say you have to hit that KPI. That's not going to, you know, no one's going to grow if we do that. We need to get around the table. Uh, we need to agree KPIs on what we want in terms of energy. So we utilize 10 years worth, 15 years of uh, Ferrari World true data to say, guys, this is how they typically perform. Tell me how we can do better in the next project. Tell me what's changed since, let's go and tour it. Show me what's changed since then to now and what we can do as a KPI that we agree over the table. Um, I think if you don't do that and look backwards, morale's in a very uh, unique place where we develop, deliver, and run. We don't sell assets. So we have that library of years of data that we can pull down off and say, guys, no, you're, you're up here. You need to be down here and agree a mutual KPI with the consultants and contractors. I think, again, early, early uh, understanding when you bring in a team, bringing them up to speed, because no one's an expert, and, and every day is a school day. You know, We all learn every day, and someone's gonna be coming to the project that has never designed something that you want to deliver before, but you need to bring them up. We all need to bring everybody up as a team and understand common mutual KPIs that we all agree on. If you don't do that, you, you, know, you, you set a, a, a bar too high from the start. And, and if, we, if we develop on that, can you give us a little bit more flavor in terms of uh, how the system working? What's the, the week in the life of, 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 a, of a Miral team that is involved in the, in the project? <laughs> so show us a little bit. It can be anything. Degree. It can be a nursery in, yes, West Yaz Plaza wants to take a floor out and have a, an atrium. It can be anything. But um, I think uh, f for us, we're lucky where we have such a wide portfolio. You know, we have... And we have sister company in Aldar, we have a sister company in ADMM that run the Formula One track. And there's always knowledge sharing between those three entities. Um, uh, I wanted to touch on the circular economy. Um, there was a really, really good example, uh, which we learned from um, Bihar in Sharjah, which is a really key uh, well, over the last couple of years, they've become a real key um, partner with us. Um, using recycled aggregates, you know, the 611 where they're building the Etihad rail. Uh, it's an, uh, not many people know this, but when we went and toured their facility where they're bringing in construction waste products and, and refining it and then using it back in the, uh, in the industry, that's 10 to 15% recycled aggregates. And you know how long that rail line is that stretches up the 611. It's engaging with people in the market who want to introduce circular economy and tapping into those streams for your construction industry because it doesn't cost more. It, the, the cost element's now gone. We were talking about expense in the past. Now it's saving you money. If, if not, it's you know saving you money or it's the same. When we're talking about the Mazda project on the Warner Brothers and SeaWorld, it's gonna, cost, it's gonna save us half a million dirhams a year on Warner Brothers versus getting power from the grid. If you can hit the CFO with cost savings, there should be no uh, negotiation. There should be, we're doing this, we're doing this. Gone are the days of renewables and circular economy costing people money. It's now saving people money and that paradigm shift is the best thing for all of us. Great, thank you for sharing. Uh, Ahmed. No pressure. Back to you now. And we are talking about this continuous learning, right? We are talking. We have been discussing also, even the, from previous panels, the role of innovation. Someone wants to slit the risks, the risk <laughs> if they don't see a new formwork. Tell me a little bit from uh, Axiona side. What have you seen as innovative solutions, as solutions that are ready for scale up, and what does it take for this solution to to take off? Yeah. Um, Easy, yeah? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the, the, the idea starts with understanding what are the contributing factors to the carbon emissions 
and then we can understand what would be the solution. It's always said you cannot solve a problem until you ask the right question. So the construction and building sectors contribute to almost 40% of the greenhouse gases emissions in the world. And the most interesting fact here that the carbon emission during the construction process of building a building is equal to the same building after completion carbon emissions for the following 40 years. So what would be the contributing factors here? The contributing factors is the transportation and production of construction materials. This is the biggest factor, which is contributes to 60% out of this. The second factor will be the energy consumed inside, because we all understand the construction sites are not connected to grid. So they are using diesel generators with, with high carbon emission. And the third factor is the transportation of manpower and staff. So how can we tackle this? I think the easiest, which I think even a kid in a school can answer this, is to localize your manpower and materials. But how? I think that, in my opinion, we, we have seen it in, in, in the region here. Modular building have been promoted by all the giga projects by PIF. Being based in Saudi Arabia, I can easily tell that the leadership of all PIF companies are focusing more on modular buildings. Modular building can, can answer a lot of uh, issues we are having. We are working under a controlled environment, less, less safety, rec less uh, uh, incidents, and less waste. So the, the other one will be using, for example, green concrete. The typical one cubic meter of concrete has 2.2 kilograms of carbon carbon dioxide. If you are using a green concrete, which has, by the way, it's used in the Red Sea, I don't know if Ian is here or not, but uh, our Red Sea had the largest green concrete plant in Saudi Arabia with a capacity, I believe, of 1,200 cubic meter per day. If you are using silica fume and fly ash, it reduces it from 2.2 to approximately 0.25 almost 90% reduction in carbon emission. That's how the leadership can make the difference. The second one, for example, in Actiona, back to Actiona, we are proud of having been a construction company, but we have a published uh, innovation hub. I am Novation. You, I'm, I'm encouraging everybody to go to internet and search for it. I am Novation, which is an innovation hub by Actiona where we are listing all the R&D projects we are working on. One of the, for example, most of the interesting projects that may be relevant to capturing carbon emissions are, we are using CO2 concrete, we call it CO2 concrete, which we are substituting Portland cement with Portland, Portland light, which absorbs carbon emission during a chemical reaction and produce limestone, limestone which is a basic component in the cement production. We are using waste paper ash to substitute cement and limestone for the soil stabilization. We are having also one of the most interesting products, which could be a game changer in the near future, which is self-healing materials for the road service, which can actually postpone or delay the major rehabilitation of a road project. So you can extend the lifetime of the road by five years, by seven years. One of the other things we are proud of is waste to energy. We have three waste to energy plants, two in, in Australia and one in Scotland, which um, their capacity is 850,000 per year. So we are reducing the waste sent to landfill and we are generating renewable energy. Also in Actiona, being an innovative company, we are the first company in the world that used hydrogen generator to uh, feed sites. So one, one tower crane in one of the sites were run by 100% zero carbon emissions generators. I think that's uh, coming back to the circular economy point of view. Uh, we need uh, leadership and we need planning. You cannot come in the middle of the project and decide that you want to do a circular economy measures, etc. It has to come at the beginning at the initiation phase. Uh, and that's also come only with the leadership. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. And even 
that's this is very important to have on your arsenal of solutions uh, some of the, the, the innovatives as you mentioned right uh, early on we heard Jesus saying if you want uh, uh, a ways to hit we will only we will only do it if it sounds right if it is in the right value chain so again you imagine the days on which concrete suppliers will only supply for windmills and solar panels and no more no more concrete available for for other unsustainable projects so quite of a quite of an interesting approach in terms of the innovation as actually the the real alternative to some of these solutions uh, I have one last question to, to make, but before that, I would like to open uh, to, the, to the audience, to the ones that remain with us. Uh, we have 10 minutes to go through questions. If we can have a raise of hands, any question to the, to the panel regarding this topic? I see one over there, another one here, please. If you, if you can just... Okay, yeah. Hi, my name is Dina Al Nahdi, founder of Circular Economy Company. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for this panel. It's yani, absolutely um, uh, thrilling to hear this topic. Obviously, it's uh, something that is not very new, but uh, it's a hot topic, as they say, and it's the trendy thing to talk about nowadays. Um, I would like to just shed uh, upon what you've all actually uh, together have said. Um, in 1995, we started my first company called Intec Environmental Technology, where we were focusing only on environment, right? Because that was, even at the time, not trendy, but it was environment. Now, back in 2000, after that, 2010, we incorporated sustainability, which is the bigger the umbrella, umbrella, right? So sustainability means, as Mariam has explained, which is obviously the environment and uh, social and economic aspects of it. In 2017, we went into circular economy, which is an even larger umbrella. So as you have mentioned, um, the importance of basically having all of these aspects embedded in the, in, in the projects. Um, Mr. Neal has mentioned that if it's not done from the very beginning, then it's virtually impossible. Um, it makes it more difficult. But I would like to say we do proud ourselves. Uh, we are based in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has been built, I mean, started obviously, you know, many, many years ago. But um, all the new giga projects are starting sustainably and in the, with the circular economy aspects and methodology in it, which is beautiful and wonderful. But 60% of our country is already built. And we are now working on readjusting their business models from the linear old school, the way it used to be, to uh, circular economy and sustainable methodologies, which means strategies and then actually implementation plans of shifting you know, this whole uh, business model. Again, as you've all rightly said, it's in phases. And the ROI of this investment needs to make sense to the business at the end of the day. So I, I just wanted to tap on that and thank you very much. I think there is a, a one part of uh, the, maybe it's construction, but then also I understand that Dr. Dila uh, has a uh, mining aspect of, uh, of the sustainability and circular economy. And there is construction also in a way that has to do with the mining. So maybe I'd like to hear a bit more of that since it's another hot topic and, Absolutely. and that we're, we're, we're working on. So Absolutely. thank you. Absolutely. So the mining element is the most challenging element, I can say. I'll give you some examples of the mining projects that I was involved in. I was involved in nickel mining projects, aluminum, bauxite mining projects, coal mining projects in uh, southern Chile, in Punta Arenas. So basically, mining is uh, itself, not only the processes, but starting from the extraction of the materials, extraction of the minerals, and so on. It's the most challenging one based on the energy intensity intensity, the carbon intensity, water in intensity, the generation of the tailings, the generation of the waste and so on. And also not to mention these are the environmental components, but majority of these projects are developed in areas where there's also the social constraints. You need to have the social license to operate. I'll give you an example, one project from Trinidad and Tobago that was an aluminum smelter mining and smelter project. The project uh, brought in uh, labor from China. From the cook, from the labor, everyone who was working on the project was Chinese. But this is a project in Trinidad and Tobago, and people need work, right? 
So basically, there were so much issues around the project, and the project didn't go ahead well, just because that they didn't listen to the communities nearby. Another project in Punta Arenas, which is, uh, again, the very bottom part of uh, southern Chile. Coal mining project, huge biodiversity. I've never seen such uh, beautiful biodiversity elsewhere. But again, because it's a coal mine, of course, we know the implications of the coal mining processes as well. There were so many strikes happening by the communities there. So what is quite important for these mining projects is to also make sure that they don't only comply with the local laws and the legislation and so on, but majority of these projects are also funded by international organizations. So they need to raise the bar a bit, not just to comply with the local laws, but what they can achieve in terms of compliance with, say, equator principles, IFC performance standards, IFC sector specific guidance documents and so on. And also, Bringing in the bringing in the bringing in the community aspects, the social aspects as well. And again, one of the key things that we always look at when we are developing projects is starting from the first question: Do we really need this project? Right. The number one question is: What is the justification behind that development of that project? Do we need it? Yeah. The second one. Can we, okay, we're going to go ahead with that, but can we, you know, re, um, uh, do a bit less than not doing anything? The, the next point is, how can we do this? Okay, we're going to go ahead and do this. Can we do it in a more smarter way? And then the last point, can we do it in a bit more efficient way? So we need to be asking these questions and definitely considering all the environmental, social, and also the governance elements to ensure that a project is implemented. Because if, if there's so many challenges uh, associated with, or the potential impacts, coming back to Mariam's point, what is our impact? That's the number one um, element that we need to consider as part of the ESG, for example. First of all, we need to be aware of our potential impacts on the environment, on the community, on the economy. How are we going to mitigate these? What kind of measures will we be implementing? And what kind of metrics or the KPIs, as Niall mentioned, or what kind of frameworks we will be following to ensure that we really walk the talk, not just talk? That's, that's I can say. Thank you. There was another question over there, please. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Zahir Awan and I'm head of projects and service delivery at Khalij Digital. Uh, my question is from all the panel members. Um, how do we make uh, sustainability and climate action an inclusive thing for all the developing world like Africa and South Asia and so on? We just recently witnessed catastrophic floods in Pakistan caused by um, climate change that left more than 33 million people affected. Um, how can a promotion of climate action and sustainability goals be pushed for these nations where there is not enough, um, er, there are not enough resources and there is not enough action on, on climate action and so on? Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll take the, uh, the question. So definitely, first of all, the, the uh, formation of sustainable development is to increase that kind of gap between nations and to address you know, these. So this is why it is important when I said to understand from the beginning of your strategy, where do you want to impact, right? There are different layers of impact the company can have as part of its strategy. So there is the impact that you have internally within your company, and then there's the impact on the society, and then there's the impact on the entire world, right? So you need to link that from the beginning within your strategy, like how do you want to contribute on all of these you know, levels and areas. And definitely when there is like, but I'm, I just don't want you to link that to 
whenever there is a crisis that is trending, we need to contribute. That's definitely, you know, the good heart and goodwill of things. But some companies do take advantage of that. And then they say, no, this is, you know, our sustainability effort. This is us doing work to, to just empower people on the other side of the world. Why for, while if you go and ask people that are working in their company, what is sustainability or what is the, your company's sustainability strategy or philosophy, whatever, they will tell you, well, we don't know what it means or we don't know. So here, this is greenwashing. This is not real sustainability. So you need to tackle the different areas and definitely there's a room for a lot of things to do. I mean, just contributing to the climate action, taking initiatives, it's going to reflect on the entire world. So it's it's going to reduce the, the, the floods, the, the, uh, the fires, everything that is happening out there, right? But the social element of things can be traced in different layers of the impact that the company can have. Thank you. Anyone else? My, just my two cents on this question. And I've, I've also, in my previous experience, I've, I've lived in uh, Mozambique for five years where uh, similar situations of floodings uh, happen. I think two things are required. One, we will have to elevate the level of our stakeholders, right? Yes. These not the ones that are uh, directly implied in, this, in the projects, but even the highest level of societies that will allow projects to succeed, right? We cannot all be like the Patagonia owner that just <laughs> uh, nominated her as a stakeholder, but we definitely need to have an alignment on, on uh, what the impacts would be, and that's why we have the community of parties, we have events like COP that trying to get on that direction, and that will be very important. And I think based on that, creating sustainable development goals that allow us to align on that direction, and again, uh, undo or regenerate a situation that has been uh, on the making for uh, for many decades, start reverting it uh, at a pace that needs to be accelerated, right? We had uh, these events now uh, being increasing in terms of frequency and in terms of, of, uh, of impact. Uh, I actually had this experience in, uh, in Mozambique and Two years ago, I was living in Germany, and guess what? Big floods happening also over there. So I think it's touching now everyone's lives, and that's why this topic is becoming more and more relevant. Is, uh, we had this conversation at lunch, didn't we, where we were talking about how different stakeholders now are asking questions. People have got more knowledge, which is really beneficial because it continues the conversation. We're developing the National History Museum for the Department of Culture and Tourism, and they asked us to do a risk analysis for the rising tide. That's the first time a client has ever asked us for that because they're worried about the asset because it's on <laughs> the seafront, whether the asset is going to still be there in 50 years time. It's like it's, if they're going to be developing these things and pouring money into them, they want to know that they're future proofed. And, and when we say we said, a, we said at lunch that the fact that every single client's now asking for a one in a hundred year storm analysis yeah. where the infrastructure is only designed for one in five year storm you start thinking to yourself we might need to go back and look at what we're designing to because the the benchmark is shifting we're seeing so many flood events you know we don't have many days of rain in the uae but when we do it's now becoming quite catastrophic Yep. Um, and, and because everybody's noticing that and it's happening across, you know, Pakistan is an awful uh, situation, but you've seen over Europe, the wildfires in Portugal, Spain, UK over the summer months is being crazy and it's affecting every economy, not just developed countries, but developing countries. And uh, I think what's good about that is giving people the tools to talk about what we're doing to change. Yeah. I see one hand raised over there. Can we have a quick question? Is our time? No, we cannot. No, I have to stop. We have to be quick. We can we can talk after this. So one less rapid fire question because uh, actually uh, it was mentioned on the panel before new skills, right? And again, coming from a Portuguese, I could not play soccer like Cristiano Ronaldo. I had to become an engineer. <laughs> so with this new challenge in terms of uh, these, what we just discussed, what do you think? Uh, the new skills are going to contribute for changing the needle even further. Very quick, uh, two skills answer one by one for us to round up this, okay. this panel. I'll start very quick. 
One thing is definitely awareness around sustainability, ESG, and so on. The reason I'm saying is that before I was pretty much the only one who was talking about environment and sustainability, but now I see that the bankers, the insurance companies, the investors, everybody has an awareness around ESG. So that's one skill set definitely to put on. And there's lots of programs out there. Even CFA has CFA, the ESG component to it. The second one, I think it's the digital also. That's also very important because we have to make sure that we have the right tools and right um, mechanisms in place to be able to uh, help us to track our progress and performance. Thank you, Dila. Yeah. Ahmed? Uh, planning and innovation. Short and sweet. Mariam? I, I will just support uh, the first thought. It is very important to educate and engage people because it's definitely everyone's role, right? And they need to understand what they're doing. They need to collectively put the KPIs in order to achieve them. So engagement and empowerment. And then from that, I'm <laughs> going to say knowledge sharing, because yeah. uh, I think gone are the days of people building silos around their organizations and not sharing information. Mm -hmm. I think we as a greater community can benefit more if we're all open and honest with what we're actually doing and sharing knowledge, what works, what doesn't work. So I think to move on from education is knowledge sharing. Yep. All right, thank you so, so much to my fellow panelists, to all of you that uh, bear with us for this last hour, really appreciate it.